When people think about branding, they think about logos, colors, emotions. If you work in branding, you can already feel your frustrations and violent reaction. And Margaret Kelsey has worked in brand, communication, and community in the past. The companies like AppCuse, InVision, and OpenView has a more holistic view of what brand is. The actual largeness of brand is like almost scary unfathomable because <laughs> there's too many touch points and none of them can be controlled or very few of them can be controlled. And it's easier to think about what are the things I can control. In this Marketing Pops episode, you learn first, why marketing is hard. Hint, it's about changing behavior at scale. Second, how content and brand can solve people problems. Third, the four parts to Margaret's strategic brand flywheel. And then fourth, how to find a thread through your career to find your next opportunity. And before we start, I've created a free power up cheat sheet. You can download, fill in, and apply Margaret's strategic brand flywheel. You can get it at marketingpowerups.com right now. Provide that link in the show notes and description. Are you ready? Let's go. Marketing power ups. Ready? Go! Here's your host. Rambly John. So it's interesting, like you're saying creative output for marketers, because like there's work creative, which is like could be draining sometimes, especially if you're doing it for a client. And then there's like creative for the sake of being creative, which is like. I think that most I think that a lot of marketers are drawn to marketing because you get to be paid to be creative. But then what happens, especially with uh, in an organization is that you have you're always thinking of what is my audience need? What is the business need? What is the audience need? What is the business need? Where is the intersection of those needs? And that can be draining in a way that like, w- like creating for yourself is just like, what do I want to make? And it's a very selfish process to just create what you want to make. And it, in your job, you can be creative, but it's always under the guise of what is the business need? What is the audience need? What is the business need? What is the audience need? And so that's what I've loved the most about my own art practice is it's reminding myself and centering myself that like, I can, I can have a point of view and I can create something that then resonates with other people rather than always thinking about what will resonate? What do I create that resonates? What are the create that the business needs? There's something another person that I chatted with, Mark Thomas, talked about like it's kind of freeing, like creating something without any KPIs attached to it. <laughs> you know, exactly. like, oh, there's no, like, I'm not like trying to sell this. I like, I'm not necessarily trying to get as many of this sold. Like, if you're creating a course for yourself, or I'm not trying to increase downloads, or I'm yeah. just creating this just to create it, essentially. Which is and I, I did that with um, the the cyanotype artwork when I first started doing it. I didn't show it yeah. to anyone because I didn't want feedback on it. I didn't mm, want people to cool. say, "Oh, you could sell that," or "Oh, if you did it this right. way, it would." <laughs> or this, I like kept it to myself because right. I really wanted for to to strengthen my own taste yeah. and my own appreciation of it. That that's so true. I feel you. You know, I listened to a few episodes with you and Devin, and you're talking about how. The marketers, marketing tends to have unsolicited opinions often because <laughs> everybody thinks they know. They think it's easy. Marketing is easy. And you're like, it, it, is, it isn't at all, right? I think that, um, oh, I probably am going to stick my, my foot in my mouth here. I think that if people think about marketing the right way, anyone could do it. I think yeah. that the problem is, mm-hmm. is that the tactical um, application of marketing is very visible. So people see the tactics and think that they understand the strategy. Right. And I think that the other thing is that um, the other thing is that I think a lot of marketers have written for marketers for MarTech companies have written articles about how to do marketing easily to try to attract. Yeah. 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 Like like content marketers have kind of distilled marketing into something that seems easier than it is by writing for their job, which is really funny kind of that we kind of like shot ourselves in the foot there. And then the there's a last thing too where it's um it's not that marketing is hard, but it's mm. the fact that changing human mm. thoughts and behaviors takes time. And yeah. that's hard, right? It's hard to wait and it's hard to invest and it's hard to know if you're doing the right thing. And that can leave a lot of um, folks who are not traditionally marketers, like founders, um, very uncomfortable in investing for a long time into something that might not 
be showing any signs of success because it just like changing humans takes a long time. Yeah, yeah it takes time. It, it, I mean, sure, you have tactics, but like no same tactic can work to change. <laughs> Everybody's different. Like, how, how do you change like uh, people's behavior at scale? Like, that's that's I don't it's know. Hard, maybe they're yeah, right? it's hard. Yeah, yeah. And, and in be- some ways, I think that we. Sorry to interrupt. I think no, that um, I think that in some ways, I've always thought sales was the harder of the two. Uh-huh. But now I realize that sales is just changing one heart and mind at a time. Wow. And that, to me, it's like you can tailor your message. You know who's on the other side. You can search and research. Like, mm. how do you distill that up so you're changing behavior at scale? Mm. Um, and I think that's a really challenging. I think that's yeah. that's more challenging now. That's a hot day. <laughs> that's like something if you post up on Twitter. Oh, when, I'll get, get yeah, but you great. do it. No, you do I, it. <laughs> it's so good. You said it. Like, I feel like it, it's true. You're right. You're tailoring what you're going to say to to this one person as a sales, you know, or maybe a group, but they're within the same company. But like marketers have to like find the balance with like tar- trying to target uh, a big enough segment that you're not, but not necessarily like trying to water down your, your message at all that you speak to no one, which is hard. Yeah. That finding that balance is super hard. It's what, what I'm hearing you saying. And I, you see that all the time with copy on websites, right? There's like mm. so much copy that means nothing. Yeah. There's so much copy that doesn't make sense, but that's okay because I'm not the target audience. So it shouldn't make yeah. sense to me and it shouldn't resonate to me. Um, and then there's lots of things that are distilled down to the point where there's website copy that's like, we are a company changing how people work. And you're like, I yeah. still don't know what you do. Yeah, you know, exactly. Aren't we all in B2B changing how people work? <laughs> like, that's true. That's true. And, and probably that's the reason why, uh, people bring, they, they make up new terms, <laughs> they make up new categories. Uh, you know, like it's like, and then people are like, what? the heck did you just it sounds smart but i still don't understand what your company does it sounds great but it, it it's confusing which yeah i can is, see the promised land but i still don't know what i'm buying i love how we're digging into this around like yeah it is about changing behavior at, at scale another hot take and this is all from episode four of uh, your show with Devin, which is the former ceo of animals I'm gonna link that show in that episode. And don't say don't say it's content. I believe that's what don't say content. Is yeah. What, what's behind that title? I mean, is that in the intro? I'm just so like I don't think we've ever. I don't. I don't know if we've really explained okay. it. But what we realized what was happening, and actually the the eventual premise that's come out of our show is the fact that what what I said before, which is that marketers make up a lot of terms that then end up meaning nothing. And I think that the word content is like that, right? And I think as a content marketer who I've heard the word content so much, right? Like I've heard Mm. founders say, oh, we just need more content. I'm like, what do you mean, right? Or we just need better content or higher quality content. And so um, it it started off as a little bit of a joke between um, myself, Devin, and our um, podcast production agency, uh, Share Your Genius. And we thought it was a funny kind of take on a little crotchety take on on the world. And then it ends up that most of our episodes actually are unpacking words Mm. or ideas that have have had so many different meanings and nobody's really sat down and aligned on what are, yeah. why are you using that word? What does that word mean to you? Yeah. Um, and a lot of our episodes end up being a, um, an almost a section of these words and terms and ideas that have been floating around, but nobody's kind of pinpointed on what they mean. Yeah, exactly. In the stuff that we talked about earlier around marketing is about changing behavior at scale is in episode four, which I'll, I'll I'll link in the show notes. But there was another thing that you and Devin were talking about how it's like it resonated so deeply within me where like, oh my goodness, I get it. You said product can't solve people problems. And I'm like, yes, it can't solve people. Pro- it can't solve process problems. It can't solve culture problems. And I am, I am curious, um, you know, what, what is, what is the meaning behind that for people who haven't heard that, that, that full episode yet? Yeah, I think that the core of the fact that product can't solve people Mm -hmm. problems is, I mean, maybe it'll be different in 10 years, but we're all human beings that come to work that are that are very complex, that have our own emotions, that have our own 
either rationality or irrationality, depending on the day. Um, and a product can sometimes solve a process problem, sometimes yeah. solve a technical challenge, sometimes yeah. solve a piece yeah. of that. Um, yeah. But it can never I- identify what the people problem is behind the issue mm. itself. Yeah. Um, and and again, maybe in 10 years with generative AI, it'll just be a bunch of bots talking to each other and we're sitting on the beach and, you know, drinking our pina coladas. Right. But for right now, we still are human beings that show up to work every day and a product can only do so much. Mm. Um, and I think that the the conversation that we were having was the fact that your brand and your content yeah. programs and your customer success and your um, everything else that you do outside of the product can surround that same problem space that your product is trying to solve for and solve it for the ways that might help the people solve it, right? So mm. your your brand and your content programs and even your community can help solve the larger problems that your target audience is experiencing where your product maybe solves a piece of it and they can expand into holistically solving a lot more of those problems. And that's where brand affinity starts to really mm. um, increase because people feel supported. They feel your target audience feels like you really, really <laughs> deeply understand them because you're solving for more than just the the problem that your product solves for. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is like really, you can't just like give the product and be like, you can figure this out. <laughs> In certain situations that it's possible. But for more, especially in B two B, I think you're you started talking about this this flywheel in in the, that episode. Uh, there's a four parts to it. Can you what is that four parts? And you're you're like I said, you're already starting to dig into it. That that really contributes to making sure that you know your customers are as successful as possible. Yeah. So um, it's internal culture, external brand, content, and community. Um, and I think building that flywheel and, and specifically tasking a, a brand team or a brand organization to build and own that makes the uh, makes brand an actual strategic function within your organization mm. rather than, a, you know, a keeper of colors and fonts, fonts. and voice <laughs> and tone and all of those things that become they become less yeah. of um, less of almost like a hall monitor. And more mm. of a an actual strategic function. And so how I think about that is internal culture um, is all of those, you know, culture things that we think about, but also uh, specifically cultural values. And I think the closer that your internal cultural values are to your external brand values and that those brand values then actually attract your target audience. So it should be shared values for your community or for your target audience. The more that all of those values are aligned, they actually become a shared decision-making framework for people to be able to make really, really smart and and uh, powerful decisions um, within your company, right? If your culture, if you're if you're hiring for specific cultural values that you also know that your target audience cares about, mm. then any time that your content marketer writes something, anytime that your customer success person responds to a problem and they operate within that value framework and making a decision based on your company values, they're going to get it right like 99% of the time. Mm. And that also unlocks, obviously, management to be able to focus on other things other than just like always answering questions about what people should do. Um, But then I think that your culture also, the piece of it is not just your values, but also your obsession with your customer, your target audience, right? right? And I think that the more that you can bake that into the culture of the organization, that everything you do is in service of your target audience, then you create content and community that's bespoke for your target audience. And then you start to listen to what they're saying and listen to what's happening at the forefront of their industry. And you can feed those insights back into your organization, into your product for, you know, understanding what product features or, or new products to build. And, and so it starts to become this like affinity flywheel where you really care about your, your yeah. target audience. And then they start to give you ideas and insights and that sort of thing. Mm. What I really I'm hearing is like this... Affinity is really about making customers feel like you care about them and not just like just because I'm trying to decrease churn or like decrease my revenue, but like I'm changing, we're changing our culture because we don't just want you to feel that we do actually really f- care about you as a customer. Is, is exactly what I'm hearing is about making those customers feel like you care for them and 
actually living it. So because it people can smell that bullshit, you know, when 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 you're like faking it just to hit your KPIs is is exactly what I what I how this works. So the funny thing too is like the older I get, the more sober I am with like we are actually all in business though, where like. Right. It does have business value and let's not be cute about the fact mm. that like I actually think it's a better way to build a business because I think a business will be bigger and and longer enduring if they do it this way. Um, ideally, you are also hiring people on on your teams that deeply care about this problem space right. or the target audience or that sort of thing. So it's not that it's disingenuous, but we also yeah. do have to acknowledge the fact that it's not completely altruistic. It is because we we are in business and probably a for profit business. If you're in B two B tech, it's you're making a, hopefully making a profit. Right. Hopefully, the goal is to eventually make a profit. Um, and so the, the like we have to be clear about that. Like there mm. is a strong business case. This is not just pure altruism. This is a good point. Uh, what I'm what I'm really seeing is like you're getting value from both sides. Like they're getting value, and you're getting value through the profit. So like there's. You know, it's 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 win win. <laughs> yeah. Essentially, well, it's not them. Yeah, and I think that the the important thing here, and I have said this now in a couple different places, and nobody's actually gotten to, as mad as I expected people to get, uh, which has been good that I'm not stirring up too much drama. But I I fundamentally believe that the arc of software is that it is becoming a commodity. I think it's easier mm. to spin up tech than ever before. That's true. I think that um, even with generative AI, uh, non-technical people can code because they can just feed it and tell yeah. it what it wants to build and it'll it'll build it for you. So I think the arc of progress is that technology and software will continue to become a commodity. And I fundamentally know that commodities compete on branded distribution. <laughs> And so to me, it's also a future-proofed investment for software companies to make to start competing on brand because what they're gonna what they're already seeing and will continue to see is competitors get spun up easier than ever before. And competitors can match your speed of yeah. um of releasing. You know, and actually smaller companies are probably faster at releasing products and features than bigger companies are at this point. And so Again, that's only going to continue. And so I always think about like, well, what's actually defensible right now? And I think defensibility is in brand and in community um, and in distribution. Before I continue, I want to thank the sponsor for this episode, 42 Agency. Now, when you're in scale-up growth mode and you have to hit your KPIs, the pressure is on to deliver demos and signups, and it's a lot to handle. There's demand gen, email sequences, rev ops, and more. And that's where 42 Agency, founded by my good friend Camille Rexton, can help you. They're a strategic partner that's helped B2B SaaS companies like ProfitWall, Teamwork, Sprout Social, and HubDoc to build a predictable revenue engine. If you're looking for performance experts and creatives to solve your marketing growth problems today and help you build the foundations for the future, look no further. Visit 42agency.com to talk to a strategist right now to learn how you can build a high efficiency revenue engine. Thank you also to the sponsor for this episode, Ahrefs Free Webmaster Tools. Now, if you want to rank your website higher in search engines, you have to make sure that your website doesn't have any technical SEO issues. Because if you do, that's like trying to run a race with your shoes tied together. That's how you lose, and we don't want that. Luckily, Ahrefs Free Webmaster Tools can crawl up to 5,000 pages to find 140 common technical SEO issues that could be holding your site back from generating valuable traffic can also help you find your strongest backlinks as well as analyze keywords you're ranking for and see keyword search volume and ranking difficulty for each of those keywords. You can sign up for free at ahrefs.com forward slash webmaster tools or find the link in the description and show notes. Well, let's get back to the episode. We've been talking a lot about like brand and I'm, I'm assu- I've been assuming that, um, you know, that defensibility uh, is about whoever can... I keep saying feel. Whoever can make that customer feel like they cared the most compared to the competitors. Is that how how would you define like brand uh versus like you know the what we you mentioned earlier, not just fonts and colors and yeah. brand guidelines? You I think I think about it the same way that when we think about consumer brands, right? There is mm. there is something that people 
when you buy a brand, it means something about your character or your personality trait or who you want to be or who you aspire to be, right? It's like little badges of honor of or badges of personality that happen with consumer brands. And I think that that software companies and software brands can start to do the same thing where it mm. means something to use yeah. Asana instead of, you know, another tool. It means, mm. I don't know, maybe you're smarter, maybe you're more organized, maybe you're whatever that is, right? Yeah. Like there is a feeling behind it and, a, and an attachment to either an ideal or a personality trait. Um, and the more companies can start to align to those things that their target audience cares about feeling and being, the more you can create mm. emotional resonance in your brand, right? Because it's not just like, oh, the products and the feature sets and the yada yada. It's what does this mean about me that I decided to make mm. this decision, this purchase decision, that I use this tool every day, that I've decided to change my workflow or my process in order to um, use this tool instead of another one, Um and I think that's the powerful thing about brand. Mm. And all of that is like a culmination of everything that they've experienced through your, like consuming your blog posts, yep. joining your community, going in your webinar, the clothes that the people wear from the company that is showing up on the webinar and the words you specifically use. Are your titles all caps versus like, is it sentence case? Uh, all of that culminates to that feeling that people get essentially. So it's not just that font and colors, essentially. Yeah. And it's every touch point. And I think that can be scary to a lot of businesses to think about the um, the largeness of brand. I think it's easy to kind of refine it and be like, oh, I only have to worry about those that checklist of items. It's fonts and colors and whatever. Not like it's every email that anyone has ever sent externally. It's every single person that has my company attached to their LinkedIn including afterwards where they go and what they do like the the actual largeness of brand is like almost scary unfathomable because there's too many touch points and none of them can be controlled or very few of them can be controlled and it's easier to think about what are the things i can control um mm. i think that that's when we go back to brand owning cultural values and aligning mm. them to external brand values and then using your cultural values as decision making frameworks helps because it scales that process of every brand touch point feels like the same brand touch point because you're using the same decision making framework mm -hmm. to make the decision or to have the conversation yeah. and instead of like oh everyone memorize this voice and tone playbook it's more like if you all operate from the same value, you will do that thing, right? If you value speed and efficiency, mm. then it makes sense that your voice and tone is going to be short and direct and yeah. the user experience of it, there's going to be good bullets and instead of big wordy paragraphs because that's part of your cultural values and you value those things. So it becomes like a more scalable way to yeah. to scale culture, if you, a scale brand is if you think of your cultural values as part of that. Yeah, that that's a great example. You know, if there's if speed is one of your values, don't don't give me like a thousand word sentence. <laughs> Essentially, like just give me bullet points or like. And the, or do the, I spend a bunch of time and research before I write the email back, or do I write the email back saying, "Hey, I'm on it," and let me do some mm, research and that sort of thing. Like, yeah. there's there's so many like um, decisions that can happen that if you base them on your values, the answer becomes clear rather than. Um, rather than kind of everyone doing their own thing. That, that makes sense. You mentioned this uh, a little bit about like how this is a flywheel, how, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how community feeds back the culture and how I'm, hear, I'm hearing or uh, thinking about it is that the more you learn about your customers and your community, the it kind of shapes your second iteration or maybe multiple iterations of your culture. Is that is that ab ab about right or like did I did I get that wrong? Yeah, no, I, you're spot on. So I think um, with with community, we can think about it two ways. There's communities that already exist where your target mm. audience is already around a water cooler that exists. And then eventually you can create your own, right? I think people get stuck there where they think that they have, like their community has to be an owned community and it has to be a thing and we got to, you know, use a tool. And I'm thinking of community as the biggest sense of the word, which is, mm. are there collective groups of people that feel like they belong to something, mm. right? Yeah. And so when when we talk about that, like, can we create a sense of belonging with a group of people? Yeah. Um, then I'm using that as the terminology of community rather than like a tactical application of like, 
there is a software that builds community or a, a Reddit community or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and so when you invest in community, which is investing in participating um, with a group of people providing value, um, participating in this sense of belonging that we all are together and sharing things and, and have cultural norms and have whatever, you have a pulse, a finger on the pulse of what's happening with mm. that target audience and you feed those insights back into the organization, knowing that not everybody in the organization can be so external facing, can s- spend so much time with the community. Um, I mean, ideally, everyone's kind of baked into it, and it's it's baked. But I, I think with with brand and content, they tend to to be able to live in that external world a little bit easier. Um, and yeah, you build those those insights, and if you need to update a cultural value because the culture of the community at large shifted then you have your finger on the pulse to be able to recognize the signals that we all care about something different now or that the conversation has changed or even as silly as like the, you know, memes that the community uses has changed, you know, That's like so that one's right. out, this one's in, right. like, let's make sure we're adding that into our marketing materials, mar- adding that into our customer success materials, like all of those things, like you can really start to, um, to make sure that everyone within your company understands the changes that are happening so that when they are using their shared decision-making framework and their shared values to make decisions, that they're spot on still making sure that everyone feels emotional resonance with your company. There was like a hot take that you said in one of the episodes for Don't Say Content around the word belonging, that the opposite of belonging is fitting in. And I'm like, dude, that just like- that mess you up? That mess you yeah, up? I did. It was like, shoot, that is so right. Because like people think the opposite of belonging is like not fitting in, but like fitting in is about like trying to curve your edges so that you fit the puzzle. Whereas belonging is like every puzzle piece is different, and they might not fit together in that in that picture, but they still belong essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was Brene Brown that said that to me and I or not to me. That would be amazing if she said it directly <laughs> to me. But uh, it felt like she just grabbed me by the collar and said right. that directly into my eyes. I was like, oh, I heard you on that one. Um, but I think even going back to the beginning of the conversation when we we're talking about um, having creativity outside of your yeah. um, your work practice. That's what that feels like to me is it feels like my own creative practice reminds me of belonging reminds me of my like being my full authentic self which mm. sometimes can be such a, a a phrase that's said so many times that it means nothing but um that allows me the reminder that like it's okay to be different and then the experience of belonging is the accepting of people um in their their truest forms rather than everyone has to be um, the same. And then it reminds yeah. me when I'm going and pitching marketing ideas or, or um, championing marketing ideas that the weird ones might mm. be more interesting than the safe ones, right? Mm. Like, let's be a little weird here because we want to, we want to reach out and accept and identify and um, welcome the weird bits of others yeah. rather than make sure everyone feels like we're all the same it's funny you say that i forgot who it was on linkedin maybe it was david gerhardt where like he showed like a bunch of um companies within the same industry and at some point they started looking the same like same color same box they're like trying to fit in because they've gone enterprise or they've gone i feel like this is like kind of bringing to point that hey if you can't really accept um others weirdness if your company itself doesn't want to be weird yeah. Is, is that well, what's your take on that? Yeah, I I um I think that it is an unfortunate thing that happens as companies mm. get bigger as they start to get enterprisey, right? Like that enterprise blue always creeps into a logo cool. or or you know what you know exactly. Yeah, I know I see, see it. There's everywhere. like a yeah, one enterprise blue, blue where company's yeah. brand goes to die. Um and I do think that that is unfortunate fortunate because I think that um, it, it it starts to like, you know, muddy the water a little bit in yeah. terms of of the the resonance. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, I think it, I understand why it happens, but it's just the the so, longer that you can hold on to the weird bits, the better. I think. I mean, this is a hard question because it's hypothetical. But if you if you were in that company that's like going to the enterprise blue, would you be like, I'm Audi, <laughs> or is there something you? Is there something you could try to like, hey, hey, wait a second, like we're starting to go enterprise blue here and starting yeah. to like try to fit in. Like, I'm, I'm guessing it depends on your influence, but like, I'm curious. Yeah, uh, I've definitely yeah. later on in my career become more and more outspoken about mm. what I think needs to happen. I mean, it's helpful right now as an advisor <laughs> to be outspoken. I mean, it's very useful yeah. to me and actually strengthened my own um confidence to be able to rattle the cage a little bit and and uh, stamp my feet and and <laughs> demand things to, to be different. Um, but I do think uh, the challenge here, which is not perfectly what you asked, but I think there is nuance here around the fact that being internal, it's very, very hard mm. to do that um, yes. a lot of the time. And I think yeah. for some reason, and this was actually pointed out to me when I was in-house at OpenView, it was pointed out to me and it made so much sense and it opened my eyes immediately that um, part of the reason that people bring in advisors and consultants and external people to give the same opinion that that person has is for some ounce of credibility that like yeah. there's an external person that also feels this way, which yeah. is a little silly to think that like there's, you know, that is a reason outside of like there's a new idea mm -hmm. or a, a better way. There's just like external validation of an idea is also worth a lot of money. Um, but I don't want people to think that like if they're in internal and becoming a little bit of a problem child that they're doing anything wrong. Like that's just what it yeah. feels like internally when you start to be a problem child. Um, and that there is, I don't know, there is a, it, it, it's, it's just candidly different when you're outside of the organization versus inside of the organization. That's true. It's, yeah, you're right. It's so happy. Like when I was working with Wes, Wes Bush. Uh, one of the advice that he gave to this company is like, oh, take off your email confirmation. And the guy was like, we've been trying to do this this whole time. And then he, Wes told it to the CEO. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And like, I've been telling, the guy was like, I've been telling this to you for two years. <laughs> it's like, like come yeah. on, man. Come on, I've man. seen that time and time again on both being in-house and doing it and saying yeah. the same thing again and again. But then also now, Interesting. As an advisor, realizing my like sheer power of just being like sheer my power. my my impact deferential yeah. increased wow. just by <laughs> leaving and going external. And now it's like, whoa, it's bizarre. It's a power trip. This is an ad for people to leave their job and become advisors. I know. Sorry, I'm, I didn't <laughs> mean okay. for this to be like a come in. Water is wonderful. <laughs> come to the dark side or the bright. I don't know the um, light side. I don't yeah. know what to call it. Come I think the it's the light side. side. Yeah, yeah same. I, I, do. I do. We've been talking a lot about this. What would you call this? You've been calling a flywheel, brand affinity flywheel. What would you call this? Because I need to give like some marketing. I know. <laughs> well, that's my fear is like, do I give it a marketing name? And then it's just some other thing that gets like, oh, this is, you know, there's a screenshot somewhere that a founder sends their marketing team being like, this is what we need right. to do. And everyone's like, yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, I, what I really think this is, is a, a uh, way for brands to truly be strategic levers within an organization. So if we're going to call it like a, I don't know, brand efficacy framework, strat, brand strat, strat, I don't know. I don't know what to call it yet. Um, but I think there's something there. And I just think that this is the way if you want to think about everything that brand should touch and own um, outside of the normal small checklist of of being a hall monitor on these certain things that get created, um, this is what I would put under their purview um, and their influence to make sure that that it's truly a, a strate strategic and impactful yeah. organization. That that makes sense. A brand efficacy lover or five. Yeah, or, I don't know. Yeah, don't try we'll, to we'll make it. Don't up. try to lock <laughs> it down. <laughs> a, is there a have you come across a company that does this well? Like where, you know, if, if you were going to look at a company that does this brand fly real, <laughs> really well, wh which companies have you seen or even worked with or like maybe, uh, yeah, that has done this for things well? It's so funny. I feel like when in that same podcast conversation, Dev and I were talking about the fact that, um, and it could just be that 
that is where we're at in our own careers right now. But the ones that we think about are the ones that did this back in, you know, 2014, 2015. Like I think Buffer was really, really great at this, still is. Um, I think that um, like Zendesk, Mm. Wistia, um, there, there had like, there was companies that cropped up around that time when like PLG was not even called PLG yet. It was, yeah. I don't know, we were calling it like B to C to B or something. And um, we didn't have a name, the, the name PLG yet for it. But um, yeah. there was this understanding that if you needed to build a uh, go to market motion that it requires a, a free trial or freemium experience, you need to have a large uh, funnel of, mm. of free acquisition. And that comes from attracting as many people from your target audience as possible, as cheaply as possible. And that tends to be in this, you know, brand top of funnel content community, inbound marketing, jargony, jargon and jargon. But it was that kind of movement um, that started, I think, for software companies to uh, begin to think about how do we look at not how we how do we look at our the finance and procurement person that's going to make this decision that then the software is going to get rolled out through the company, but truly how do we target the end user and get them to care about our our company? And I think that um, I'm sure there's fantastic companies doing it right now. But I think the ones that always come back to me are the ones that I kind of grew up alongside of when I was at Envision, when I was watching them all do it too. And and we're kind of sharing um, tactical implementation of this stuff. That makes sense. Yeah, those are some really classic ones. Uh, one one that I've recently come across, well, it's been around for a while, is around Gong. They've been using a lot of memes. Oh, yeah. We, we talked about quite a Gong's bit. Gong's great. Yeah, and then they have, I don't know if, I think they have a customer community, uh, but they've re- they've really like gone all in being weird <laughs> with with his yeah. social posts. Yeah, and a strong um a strong uh, content program, and then I think too that they're um like people who use Gong will say stuff like, "Oh my god, I love Gong, and I need Gong," and like it's like the that kind of affinity of like like I don't know, right. like I've seen the gong like i can envision envision the gong logo in my head very easily and that's same probably because i've seen it on a t-shirt and a you know and people yeah. are wearing it proudly i love it i thank you for for sharing this i actually want to uh any final before i shift and talk about career power-ups any final words or tips to to marketers who are tuning in around brand around this flywheel around like yeah i think a a a huge kind of blanket recommendation right now is to not be too stuck in the work you have been doing. Mm-hmm. If you are an expert in a certain channel or a certain type of marketing, a certain style of marketing, um, I think what we've seen mm-hmm. definitely over the last three and a half years, but but specifically over the last, I don't know, six months, year, is that everything is changing rapidly underneath us on both a macro level, but also a channel level and a consumer behavior level. And like everything is changing way faster than it used to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that if if more marketers can come back to the, the basics of why do I even do the work that I do? Like what is what am I even trying to do in this channel or with this playbook? Um, the more that you can start to draw parallels to other types of marketing to other tactics to other channels to other whatever the other specificities that your company might need and you're going to start to see new opportunities um and so i would say don't be too precious about the work you've been doing or the or the specialization that you've been in because the marketers of the future will need to be super super adaptable i've mm-hmm. said i would take a scrappy generalist today over the best um you know the best uh a specialist any any day of the week right now because I think we just need that kind of um, experimentation and fire in marketing again. I love that. No, that's good. It's good final advice around that topic. Let's just talk about career power ups. I think you've been in marketing now for about fifteen years. I, I'm like trying to cut. <laughs> you know, based on your LinkedIn, you worked at Envision. You work at AppQs, which a lady apparently... never tells her age, but yeah, it's probably around there. <laughs> You've also worked at OpenView, but like you have this amazing career. Now you're an advisor, you have the show. I'm curious, what's the power up that's helped you with your career? There's something that could be a soft skill. It could be 
networking. It could be something more marketing related. But what is something that's like helped you uh, get a leg up when you uh, in your in your career? Um, I think I've always been tried to be pretty introspective of why I am doing the thing, why I want the next job, why I would want to go to that company Mm. versus not. Um, And what that's created now that I've looked back on my career is a really strong red thread through all of these different opportunities. And so while I didn't see it at the time, but I was being introspective about what is most interesting to me with every new opportunity, now that I look backwards, I can see that I've always been um, obsessed with creating shared language. So originally, um, when I was a content marketer, it was creating shared language with my target audience, right? Making sure that when I was at Envision that I was speaking um, a shared language with designers that I really, even though I wasn't a designer, that I could understand where they were coming from and what they cared about and that I was using the right words. And because I didn't know what I was talking about, then I was actually getting designers to write for me because I couldn't do it. Um, but I was really, I, I cared about that. And then when I started to manage people, I started to really care about the shared language of our team about making sure that people felt like they belonged and felt like they understood how to be highly uh, performing, that they understood how to be stretched, but also how to be supported. Um, And then I started to look upwards as how do I create a shared language as I manage up, right? As I start to make sure that executives understand what I'm working on and what my team's working on. And, um, And now that I'm external, I really care deeply about this shared language between a founder and their head of marketing. I think that this right. is like the next piece of my career of of um, creating shared languages to make sure that that this relationship works really well. Um, so now it's, again, something if you're early in your career, you might have no idea what your red thread is going to be. But if you're thoughtful enough about the the opportunities in front of you and what thing you want to work on next and what part of your brain um, you want to activate, then eventually you'll, you'll look back on your career and have a pretty strong pattern of, of what it all meant. Mm. I'm curious when it's the you know it's the right time to move on. Like I'm sure it's um, you you looking back at like you knew it was time to move on when X happened. And did you get advice from folks or how, how? I guess how did you figure out what was next after you know it's time to move on? Yeah, sometimes it takes a while from me yeah. from when I know it's time to move on to figuring out what's next. And um, I think that's a, a normal occurrence to kind of be done with it before you even know what's what's the next thing. Um, I always feel that within myself that I get, I get bored. I just like, I just get bored and it's not overwhelm. It's, it's burnout. And, and Mm. I think the difference between the two is, um, burnout is when you don't have the emotional ROI of the work anymore, where Mm. just like you're putting in work and you don't feel a return on investment and and the emotions and the energy that you're putting into it. Um, so that to me is a very big signal, Wh- whether the opposite of that is overwhelm, where you have so much to do and maybe you love it all, but you, um, you, yeah. you know, have a lot of work on your plate and you're feeling chaotic and overwhelmed. Overwhelm can usually be solved by taking time off and taking a vacation and taking a break. Yeah. Burnout is rarely solved by that because you come back mm-hmm. to the same situation where you give energy and you don't get it in return. Yeah. So to me, it's a very clear yeah. signal when I've burnt out, not because of overwork or or anything like that, but just because the the emotional ROI isn't there. That's a, a very clear signal to me. And and when I feel it coming on, it's it's almost a little sad sometimes because I'm like, oh, damn it, I've solved the interesting problems and now I'm done. That's an interesting concept, emotional ROI. This is actually the first time I've heard. Of. I understand like it totally makes sense when you say it. Like your the emotion you're putting into it is not. You, you don't feel like you're getting a return, like you're, I guess, talking about affinity and bread. <laughs> you're not, you're not, you don't have that sense of affinity now for yeah. that work, the team, or maybe the company, or that I'm not entirely sure, but whatever it is, there's, you've lost the affinity has gone away, essentially. Yeah, exactly. In terms of like, uh, you were talking about, uh, you know, when it's time to move, how do you find, like, how, I guess, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, what, well, how do you find your next step? Do you like I'm talking about like do you have any advisors or like you just start looking when you know it's like you've lost that affinity or like what would be your how do you do it in the past and for people who are tuning in who might be feeling that emotional ROI, uh, what would be yes. the steps you would give to them? 
So I'm a little woo woo with this. And I um, fully believe that when you start to make um, a little bit of effort, the universe will start unveiling opportunities to you. Mm -hmm. And so I think the first thing is you just have to make some sort of movement to what you want that's different, whether that's reaching out to people in your network. Um, I hate the word. Like, I think the term networking is like like one of those like old fashioned words where like, I don't really like to network, but I like to talk to the people that I like to talk to that I has in my, I guess, network. (laughs) Um, So part of it is that you start putting out the feelers, you start understanding what it is. You start to maybe even have um, conversations and recruiting calls and things like that. Um, And you see what feels good and not good to you. Right. And I think Mm -hmm. um, part of me is, is I usually make, my own kind of decision making framework on what things I value in the next opportunity, um, what things I want, what things I don't want. But that only really comes from me having a couple calls and starting to research companies and starting to understand it. And so when I was leaving OpenView, I was starting to think about that of like, what is my next step? And and my decision framework was was much different than it used to be, which was what was the next um, in-house job that I wanted. Um, instead, what I really wanted this time around was I, I cared a lot about decoupling um, uh, impact had, money made, and hours worked. Mm. And I wanted each of those to be independent levers because I wanted to explore what enough was for each one of those things. You know, I've been in high growth startups. I've been in a venture capital firm. Um, I've been in these places where um, hours worked was a pretty locked in thing. Right. You know, <laughs> you didn't get to really play around with that. It yeah. was like a lot. Um, and also in marketing, it's not a variable business or it wasn't really a, a variable comp structure. And so money made when you join a company is also yeah. pretty locked in. The thing that you can kind of play around with is impact had, but that's organizationally um, depends on the organization and the structure and the team and all these different things. And so what I became obsessed with in this last time around was um, once those things became really clear to me, I was like, the only way to have those each of those things be independent levers is to go off and try to build my own business so I can play around with what enough feels like. That's such a good framework or like a mental model, like that three levers that income made uh the impact made and the third one was time time yeah time hours worked sp- like how much time work. i and it's really right. funny because what i realize is i'm a total impact junkie and so um i used to think like oh how much hours do i actually need right. to feel like i've used my brain in a way that because i it's not zero like i yeah. candidly when i was on maternity leave i was desperate to use my brain in a in a strategic way again like i was it's not zero hours for me. Like I need some of this work in my life, which was also a really great realization mm-hmm. to understand that I don't have to do this. I really want to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, but the hours worked. At, what I realized was like, as long as I'm having impact, I am mm-hmm. limitless. That's true. And that impact, especially as you scale up your advisory, you do more courses, you you can lower your hours work and increase your impact and income made, which is like, I guess another reason why people should come to the the light <laughs> side of the point of the The water is wonderful. Come on in. So don't tempt don't tempt us. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm just joking. That's what I've been I feel like do I need of- a disclaimer of like I am not I am not trying to influence anybody to leave their current job, especially if I have a contract so with funny. you where I'm not supposed to bring people away from your company you're, you're changing behavior at scale <laughs> oh god <laughs> that's funny it's something mass i've been thinking, exodus. <laughs> thinking a lot mass. it is happening i feel like people are becoming more aware of this like with layoffs and like you know like it's not as secure as people think like working at a full-time job because you're locked in the hours and you can't con- there you can only control so much of those three lovers yeah you know like Actually, you can't really control any of those levers unless you you have some kind of impact. Leverage. You can yeah. kind of like have more impact, have less impact, care more, yeah. care less kind of thing. But that's like, true. that's the only one that you really get to. And that's why people like that's why that whole thing around quiet quitting was was going around is because it's like really the only lever if you're full time employed that you can um, do is that's kind true. of this hours worked impact had thing where you just kind of coast, right? You maybe work less hours and have less impact and, but you still make the same amount of money. And like, that's quiet quitting as those levers kind of in that, in that, um, position. Yeah. So, um, right. 
I think that the the to your point though about like a uh, marketing exodus right now, it is really interesting because I think it's not the worst thing in the world. I think more companies are looking, especially as everything is changing and shifting, they're looking at scaling their marketing team as more of a, a fractional or freelance way. Like I feel like a, a couple years ago, we wouldn't have never thought of having a, you know, a freelance brand designer or a freelance, mm. whatever yeah. it might be. And now it's kind of baked in that you're going to have a lot of freelance support on your marketing team. And so I don't think it's the worst thing that there's a lot of folks leaving or getting fired from full-time roles and starting up their own freelance businesses or, or fractional businesses. I think that that's probably what both um, businesses want and need at this moment when they're trying to figure out their strategy. Um, but I also think that the, the reason that this is happening is because um, marketers have kind of lost their way for a little while. Like we mm. were starting to be a little fat cat syndrome where there was money going around. We didn't have to yeah. be super efficient with what, how we were spending it. We could, you know, kind of coast and rest on our laurels. And and right now we're back into like wartime mode, right? Do more with less. And yeah. um, I think that there's a lot of marketers out there that haven't quite haven't quite been re- really judicious with every dollar yeah. spent or hour spent. I want to be clear that like it's not just your budget, but it's also your hourly allocation to different things, right? Like this whole idea of of maniacal focus and killing your darlings is something that I I am constantly co- coaching marketers on because we we like to do a lot of things and spread ourselves yeah. thin and never kill a program. And um, I think that can be. I think that can be really hard for founders and CFOs to look at and be like, what are you doing over there? <laughs> I, I feel like the reason why this, they're doing uh, marketer marketing teams are doing a lot is like there's that insecurity. Like it, some of marketing is hard to measure. So by measuring the number of blog posts we put out or the number of videos or the number of webinars, like, hey, that's measurable. But like some of the stuff is like, it's hard to measure in terms of, uh, in term, I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, attribution is hard. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And this is the thing. If you're only measuring attribution, yeah. then it is really hard to know what to kill. But if we're thinking of marketing as essentially two functions, yeah. the first is saturation of channels where your target audience lives with a consistent message that mm-hmm. resonates. So you're hijacking frequency and recency bias. You're staying top of mind with your target audience. You're not even converting them yet. You're literally mm-hmm. just saturation of a channel with a message that resonates. The second part is identifying signals of readiness and then converting those people, right? Mm -hmm. So attribution can happen in that second part. And you maybe have some attribution to the first part. But what we need to do is know that like there's ways to goal and measure each of those marketing functions, right? Like some people call it brand and demand. Some people would like there's we've, again, muddied up the waters with all of these terminologies around what these things actually are. But if we can agree that marketing is fundamentally those functions, then when we start to look at, okay, all of our like brand and like content programs, the the goal is a consistent message in a channel that our target audience lives already lives in. So it's like consistency, resonance of message, whether like and we can test that in lots of different ways. And the goal is not actually even converting yet on that point. It's literally just, did we do the thing? Did we do the thing? Are we consistently showing up? Are we in that feed? Are we in their inbox? Are we in their physical, you know, direct mailer mailbox? Um, And so I think that um, we have to think of marketing as both of those things and not just get so lost in attribution land where we're saying, oh, well, you know, everyone that came through actually was first touched Attri- first touch attribution goes to this thing, even You're though right. they heard about us for five years on our podcast before they um, actually had the the pain point enough to come inbound through the thing that worked. So, yeah, um, yeah that I'm always fighting against that because I think <laughs> that if we're only going by attribution, we're missing a big piece of the pie. So good, it's so true. I love I love that. Like really, like cut down. Um, I'm curious. I feel like once again, this is a, this feels like an ad for people who want to get into advisory. But if you had a, a, what kind of advice would you have for marketers who are like, they they are in that mode where like they're looking for the next thing and they're like considering advisory, uh, doing an advisory role. You already talked earlier about like reaching out to your network and asking like advice and like you know opening up doors. 
any other any other tips that you would share for people who might want to step into uh, what is that called the warmer water <laughs> or, or the yeah yeah, warmer, it's, warmer, it's, uh, yeah the the ba- I don't know bathtub temperature water um it is my advice is as you're thinking about doing it absolutely go talk to people who are already doing it who are in in the uh, have their own businesses they will all tell you conflicting information on how to do your business how to structure your fees how to package sure. your work how to do whatever that's fine take all of those inputs and then figure out what would be right for you um i think the other piece is like understanding why you're doing it and what you care about mm. right like i have um the same work that you do for brand values right you can do for your own personal value work your mission vision values what you care about in this world um one of the ones that i deeply care about is this actually this like web 3 value of subtraction and so this idea is mm. that we um i have it written on my board over here we push opportunities outwards we're thrilled to see others succeed we try to matter less and so that's uh, core to my business philosophy that i've i've brought in to the point where i'm graduating people that i could easily keep on a retainer for more months but i want them i want to matter less i want them to fly i want them to go and do the thing by themselves and so it's a it's a really it's something i care deeply about but then it turned into a business value um, that uh, I think is good for the long term for the business, but definitely in the short term is a little, a little scary to right. kick people off your roster. Um, but I think understanding what you're doing it for, what you care about, um, really helps you in in your journey, and also will help you understand that um, those buckets of enough. I think I had a a really good friend. I'll call her a mentor too, but she's she's a dear friend who has been an entrepreneur for for many many years, Caroline Zook. And she, when I first started off building my own company, um, gave me that advice of understand what enough money is, like put a number on enough so you know when you reach it so you can put your energy and time elsewhere into the other things that can be built and grown and fulfilled. Because if you if that if that number isn't set in stone somewhere of like that is enough, now I can go worry about other things. Um, you will be blinded by chasing the increase of that number and not settle yeah. into um, a world in which you can truly do make a life that's aligned to your values. So I think that was really great advice. I think the yeah. the last thing that I would leave you with um, is it was on the tip of my tongue and now I'm blanking. Go talk to people about it. Go figure it out. And then, I don't know, you'll never be ready. Go try it. There's probably another job waiting if it doesn't work out. Like, give yourself a financial runway that that mm. you feel comfortable yeah, taking a chance on yourself and and have that clear in your mind of how long you're going to give yourself to, to try to make it work. And then sometimes it's just, you got to go do it. <laughs> just do it. Just do it's it. Like a, just like that Nike slogan, just, just yeah. go for it. Just Jump out of the plane. And, uh, I love that. Um, second, second to the last question, in terms of like an advice you would give your yourself, but a younger version of Margaret, like if you can travel back in time, maybe she's starting out in marketing. What would be like an advice you would set out to that that time portal, and that would help the younger Margaret maybe avoid mistakes or like, um, you know, not necessarily change the past because you know the past defined who you are, but like what would be that advice that you would give your younger self if you could. I would remind myself that I am at a company to provide impact to the business. And that mm. is my job. My job is not to work within the confined or the the defined hierarchy that exists. It's not to make sure everyone agrees with my decision or my method of whatever. It's not to I, I think that I I have over indexed on um collaboration and uh and I don't know, niceness mm. at the expense of what I should have been doing, which is understanding and figuring out how to have the the biggest impact for the business that I can. Um, I think that sometimes what I've seen from fellow marketers is that um, we see it, that a hierarchy exists. We see that there's somebody senior to us that we need to, I don't know, build a relationship with or get them aligned or, or, um, or defer to their idea yeah. when... Okay when ultimately what you're tasked to do is have the biggest impact for the business. And a lot of, on the other side, what I'm seeing from founders is that they're, um, they just created the structure, the hierarchy, whatever it is, because 
they needed one and that was one that they created. Like they're always looking at it as like, how can you, how can you have business impact? And you're like, I don't know, this hierarchy sucks. And they're like, well, I just made it up. Like I could make up a new one. Just like tell me what you need in order to have business impact. And I think that's, that's something that I both failed at that now I'm, I'm seeing a lot of conversations and helping a lot of um, visibility between founders and their heads of marketing of the fact that like, it's all made up. So you can make it up or you can change it and you can ask for it to be changed or you can highlight the fact that there is something that needs to be changed in order for you to have business impact. But it's not an excuse to not go have business impact. I had such a fun and insightful chat with Margaret. You can learn more about Margaret's work via her website, margaretkelsey.com and tadco.io. Also follow her on LinkedIn and Twitter. You can find all of that link in the description and show notes. Thanks to Margaret for being on the show. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd love the Marketing Power-Ups newsletter. I share the actionable takeaways and break down the frameworks of world-class marketers. You can go to marketingpowerups.com to subscribe and you'll instantly unlock the three best frameworks that top marketers use to hit their KPIs consistently and wow their colleagues. I want to say thank you to you for listening and please like and follow Marketing Power-Ups on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. If you feel like extra generous, kind of leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and leave a comment on YouTube. Goes a long way in others finding out about marketing pops. Thanks to Mary Sullivan for creating the artwork and design. And thank you to Faisal Kaigo for editing the intro video. And of course, thank you for listening. That's all for now. Have a powered update. Marketing Power Ups. Until the next episode.